Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live Zoom briefing of the 30th of January. And um, we keep changing it to CEO briefing, webinar, this and that. Uh, but basically, it's the same um, structure that you've been seeing the last couple of weeks. It gets improved. Uh, as you can see, um, we're now building out um, a better room to do it in. <laughs> it's pretty bare. Um, I was expecting a rolling whiteboard today, and I, um, I wagered that Amazon's two-day delivery would work. And, uh, well, I'm going to give a three-star review on that right now. Anyway, so thank you for joining me. I'm going to pull up the presentation and uh, let's get going. So here we go. So this is now called What is New Gold, as you know. Um, and really that underlines that number one, this is a, um, this is a stable thing. Water is with us. It's not going to go away. Um, but at the same time, it's increasingly scarce. Why? Because we're frankly using the rivers and oceans as a toilet. Only 20% of the sewage in the world is treated. That's 80% of what we dump goes into forever. Now, this is not true so much in the West. Um, you know, our percentage is more like the opposite percentage. But then we have almost no sewage treatment in other countries, and that's a major problem. So, um, you know, it is, uh, and, and also population growth is an issue. So as populations grow, we have a problem keeping up. Recession proof, um, I'm only mentioning that because I don't think there's a recession on the way but I'm not an expert, so. But there's a lot of concern about things being overheated and where is it going and so forth. Um, water is pretty stable. Uh, now, it's been a slow growing business and this is where I'm gonna address it, but at the very least, it's stable. So if you can find a, a stable platform for your, like a, a base load, shall we say, for your market and then drive it faster, that's a win-win. So let me get on with it. All right, so the usual safe harbor statement, which uh, tells us that um, anything I say in this uh, presentation may not actually end up exactly as I say. These are not, um, you know, I know the sun's gonna rise tomorrow, um, but as far as what we say is gonna happen, it's our best estimate. And of course, we will continue to tell you what we know as clearly as we know, as truthfully as we know, but reality sometimes end up, ends up different. And then the other thing is uh, this disclaimer, um, we are operating under a special open solicitation type offering where uh, investors can come in who are minute, who meet these minimum requirements uh, for being accredited, which is, um, you know, you have to make a certain amount of money, et cetera. Um, and, we are allowed to discuss the offering publicly and to promote it, um, which I think I may do next week just because um, we haven't done so specifically. I'm not gonna do it on this in this um, presentation, but if we do discuss it, uh, that is the exemption we're operating under. And you, of course, know that all stock involves a risk. So that's what that's about. Now, uh, this week we filed, well, we filed it last week, but we announced this morning a Regulation A filing. What is Regulation A? Uh, Regulation A is a uh, 2013 Congress passed something called the Jobs Act. Not something the SEC was happy with because it said, hey, anybody can invest in companies. Um, and for you know, more than 60 years, uh, since actually longer, since 1934, there had been safeguards against what's called widows and orphans, people who don't have the money to spare and who were being preyed upon and who, who were harmed by the recession. Um, so these were good common sense rules. Um, 2013, Congress said, well, it's not fair to the people who don't have 
you know, $200,000 in yearly income, et cetera. So what about them? And um, the SEC eventually did uh, codify this in a way that they were happy with it. Um, and gradually the regulation A uh, market has matured. And we've wanted to do this for a long time. I felt for a long time that it's terrible that we always got to rely on, you know, big investments. Um, they should be smaller investments. They can be structured in a more um, uh, democratic way, shall we say. And, um, you know, we have a lot of people who believe in us. And uh, so to not have that uh, going on is a problem. Now, um, as I say, it's, it took a while for it to, to mature, but now it is. And uh, it's a strong marketplace. When you think of it really as a Kickstarter for stocks, that's really what it is. Um, it's crowdfunding. So uh, you put up a concept and because you invest um, within, within the offering, you get special benefits. And that's what regulation is. Um, takes, you know, uh, a company that we are um, uh, friends with recently filed their um, regulation A offering. They got it 352 days. It can take that, it can take longer, um, but it's not as major as a full on in initial public offering, uh, which is uh, typically much longer. So, you know, I think that in the second quarter, this will be up and running and I think it'll be very, very good. Um, but at this point, I can't get into the specifics, but um, I think I'll be able to possibly in the future. It's important to know that I'm not making an offering right now. While this is with the ACC, it is not being marketed. I'm informing you only what was said in the press release, which is number one, it's a tier two offering, which tier two allows you to raise up to $50 million. We're raising just a bit more than $19 million. Um, the, the minimum investment is $500. And the structure is as preferred shares, meaning not common shares that generate a 10% dividend paid monthly. That's about all that I can say right now. Um, it is publicly filed. If you go on the Edgar site, look under Origin Clear, you'll see the filing and you can read it to your heart's desire. And of course, you can always check in with me, uh, email me. Uh, the best email is invest at originclear.com. Devin will get the email. He'll answer any questions, pass it on to me. I'll get involved, et cetera. So that's the regulation A picture. And we think that's very exciting. All right, last week I featured an um, a interview with our friend Satyajay Major, the Managing Director of the outstanding company Permionics in India. And um, first of all, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but a few people got the idea that uh, the whole company was gonna just get its business from India. Um, that's not true. The vast bulk of what we make in revenue is made in the United States and um, what was good about Permionics is that they are enabling us to become mainstream and not just a niche or specialized offering with our technology. So they are very good. They've got over 10,000 uh, sites. They've been around since 1982. Um, they're, they're well established. They work with large corporations and they are integrating uh, our technology with other technologies in what's called a technology train. And, you don't sell technologies, you sell products. Now, until now, we've relied on our licensees to create products from technologies. But frankly, um, they have other priorities. And so we found really is uh, Permionics has been a very good partner. They've, um, they've been sending us substantial business for our Texas operation, which is completely unusual, but to have you know, India or China send you business to work to do in the United States, uh, which is great. Um, and so they are dedicated to a level beyond a normal licensee because of the business we're going to send them and so forth. In the process, they told me that on February 14th, there was going to be the Indian Membrane Society uh, conference in Chennai, India. And I was ultimately invited to keynote the address and um, uh, provide the keynote address rather. And unfortunately, 
since then, the coronavirus has been doing um, rather intense things. We don't quite know. I don't want to be a fear monger, but at the same time, um, it seems that, you know, a lot, three million people traveled before the China uh, government imposed uh, restrictions. And so commercial travel in Asia Pacific is not great. So I said, sorry, guys, I would love to do it, but can I do it um, by video? They said, well, actually, it looks like the conference is going to be canceled because so many of the people come from China and uh, parts that might be affected by coronavirus. So um, it's unfortunate uh, when it gets redone, I hope to go and uh, stay tuned. I, I was honored to, to become a keynote speaker. You know, what would I say to the, the, uh, the water industry in India, the, the, the people doing membranes? What is a membrane? A membrane is any very, very fine, uh, very tight filter. It's almost like trying to get stuff through skin almost. It's that, it, skin is porous, but it's very hard to get stuff through skin. And a membrane is somewhat like that. It's very, very tight. And so, uh, for example, they use membranes to desalinate and other uh, applications. <clears throat> now, membranes are everywhere. There's 22, a $22 billion market worldwide for membranes. They're use, used everywhere. Um, we like the space a lot. Um, and we do a lot of membrane business out of Texas. Um, so the issue in India really is an in India, um, almost a, uh, what you call a tale of two cities, right? You have on the one hand, the Indian government spending $90 billion to, to manage uh, water flows upstream uh, in, the, in the mountains, uh, in the Himalayas above uh, the subcontinent of India. And, and yet you have uh, tens of thousands of people working by hand in sewers. And, um, you know, the information that I have is that tens of thousands clean sewers by hand and hundreds, perhaps thousands have died. Um, literally have pictures of people stepping into manholes and cleaning things up by hand. And this is routine. So you have this tremendous um, uh, polarity and how do you overcome it? The problem really is one that we see elsewhere, which is a lack of infrastructure, lack of centralized infrastructure. And what do we do about that? Um, so what my plan was really to talk about decentralization and, and that the, the people with the problem would be incentivized in some way to do something about it because India is not going to be able to put up, well, they're, they're busy trying to do these giant uh, hydrological, as it's called, projects upstream. That's consuming $90 billion. They, they probably need to put in a hundred major central plants throughout India and they don't exist. And then by the time they build them, the population will have doubled again. So they have a population bomb. I'm not one that believes in holding back population to use technology and deal with it. So what do you do about it? Well, the idea is to miniaturize it, to go to the edge and let the, the users somehow uh, enable the users through relaxed regulation, financial incentives, and technology to take matters in their own hands. And I would, that was my plan to talk about it, but instead I'm talking to you about it now. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go on to, uh, and my apologies to my friends in India. I do hope I'll come there soon. Now, uh, today I sent out a, a CEO update. Um, those of you who are on the list saw me um, showing a picture and it was about Elon Musk. What does Elon Musk have to do with disruption? Well. Everybody knows what disruption is these days, but it's a very wide word, disruption. You know, you could disrupt a classroom, you could disrupt a market, you could disrupt all kinds of things, but what is the disruption really? So here is Elon Musk, 1995, and uh, he's repairing his own window glass, which I thought wonderful. Um, Elon and I have been there, <laughs> so I know. But um, he couldn't afford to pay for repairs. He found junk parts, put them in. Here he is repairing uh, the, the broken glass. And, but here's the point, and I, I admire uh, Elon tremendously, and he, he gives hope to the rest of us who are not yet billionaires. Um, but the um, interesting thing is, 
and I'll, I'll cover where this comes from. A disruptive innovation appears inferior to incumbent, incumbents, which is the people who are already in the space, and underperforms on traditional measures. So the ugly duckling, it's the test story of the ugly duckling, and the ugly duckling could be a wolf. So um, not to make any further uh, animal analogies, Tesla started with a terrible car, speaking of, of uh, you know, inferior. Uh, the Lotus Elise was used as the frame for um, the Tesla Roadster. And in this road and track story, uh, Elon Musk tells the story about it. And um, it was not pretty. They, they first of all, the, the, they used the AC propulsion motor, uh, which worked fine um, in small numbers, um, but then it could not be scaled easily. And then uh, I believe they were using stacks of laptop batteries. And then when they put it all together, they had to like stretch the chassis and which meant it could no longer pass safety um, rules. And the bottom line is they had to start from scratch. At the time, I remember seeing it, a friend of mine had, was driving one around. There was a bunch of Hollywood people were being given these to drive around for free as part of the PR. And, um, I thought, wow, this is cool. I don't think the, the car industry took it very seriously. And I think they're taking it seriously now. So um, that was Elon starting with something that was inferior and yet, you know, um, coming up with something that, again, a disruptive innovation appears inferior to incumbents and underperforms on traditional measures. So, that quote comes from an article about my next person that I'm going to feature, Clayton Christensen. Now, during uh, the early 2000s, um, I was exposed to a book he wrote, uh, but he passed away recently and he invented this term that we use all the time now, disruptive innovations. Um, and uh, Andy Grove told the story, he said at Intel, that following having read Clayton's book, he had all of his people read it, um, which I have to tell you, um, it's very hard to get people in a company to read a book. And it's a testimony to Andy Grove's um, power of persuasion that he got his people to read it. And he realized, oh my God, we're going to be um, taken over by uh, the marketplace. And he came out with the Celeron chip, which took over, I think, 38% of the chip market after that. So it was a huge breakthrough for Intel and frankly, they would have uh, sunk because there's very aggressive players coming out of America and the uh, China, et cetera. So he, um, he took um, Clayton Christensen's advice. I was at a company in the, in the late nineties where um, it was less so, less taken. That advice was not taken as, as literally. Um, and uh, I, I, it wasn't that book. It was a different book, a book called Focus. And I was trying to get the company I was at to focus. And I remember buying 100 copies of this book and handing it out. And the irony of it was that a couple of years later, after the company crashed, um, one of my friends told me, hey, you know what? That book, Focus, I just used it to get our funding. And that company later um, got you know sold for a lot of money. So ironically, nobody in the company that was falling apart was listening, um, but people outside of it were. And, and I think that's, that's where it's at, is that the incumbents, remember the incumbents are the problem. Let's take another look at what uh, Clayton Christensen said. Okay, so he said, uh, true disruptive innovation first appealed only to a niche market and appeared less attractive. In fact, um, the incumbent typically looked on it as inconsequential to it ate up huge swaths of its mar market share. I'm not going to read this all to you, but basically um, the innovation looks inferior. Look at the Lotus Elise that, that uh, Elon tried to use. And then um, the innovation evolves and turns into a whole new thing. You know, look at PCs. PCs didn't exist. And... Um, and in fact, the, the evolution of the, the PC, um, you know, really occurred uh, while the mainframes were in pretty much the big mainframes like now, nah, it's all good. And so this, um, 
this is an interesting story because um, you have the PCs showing up and ultimately taking over the market. So you, you constantly have this going on. Now, disruptive innovation doesn't appear as a better product, but as one that makes it more accessible or more affordable to a much wider audience. So let's remember that when we get to water. This is the book, The Innovator's Fa uh, Dilemma, When New Technologies Cause Great Firms to Fail. And here's the Celeron story. Um, and um, I, I love that book. It tells, for example, the story about how, you know, the disk drive industry started with um, the 14 inch, or I think even 28 inch drives, and we got smaller, 14 inch, seven inch, three and a half inch, two, two and a half inch, then, you know, tiny. Uh, and each time, what was strange was, the, the smaller product that eventually took over was developed in the labs of the company that had the larger earlier product. But that company, whoever it was, let's say quantum, right, uh, could not um, accept the smaller technology because it would destroy their sales figures. They would cannibalize themselves. So the engineers who did that left, started another company, ate quantum's lunch. Thank you very much. So that's what happens um and it happens very very quickly so um the the um the whole lesson is don't be afraid of smaller cheaper products all right which brings me to my friend tony siva i covered his uh his video last week and i'm still working on optimizing um zoom with uh youtube i think we have to go over to I think Vimeo is the right platform. So I will start playing videos, but probably next week. But um, Tony had something to say, and this is at uh, October's, last October's Robin Hood conference in New York. And um, here he is. So here he's talking about various technologies, which all add up. We've got Moore's law with computing. We got um, data storage improving 50% increase every 18 months. Digital imaging, everybody's got a law here, these all different people, uh, network capacity and batteries. Well, all these things contribute to each other on top of each other. They don't just stack up and go long down the road. They stack on top of each other and they contribute to each other. So when you have multiple technologies in a marketplace, it accelerates adoption. Earlier in this video, he talks about how disruptors come from outside. I covered that last week. Okay. And here's the other interesting thing, which is technology adoption S-curve, where um, the install base has this sharp uptick while prices are going down. And then uh, as the price starts to level up, it's still going down, you get a continuing adoption until you get virtually to 100%. This was the adoption, for example, of Color TV. So... Um, you know, we have this uh, intersection of adoption and price, and that's kind of what makes it happen. So again, you have a high, ad uh, tremendous, tremendous adoption that really syncs up with price. And this is very important to remember. Okay, now how is decentralized water disruptive? That's the, the big question. And so let me, uh, let me count the ways. So first of all, we have a typical decentralized, uh, this is from the Lux Research um, webinar that uh, I've quoted many times. And if you would like to get a link to the webinar recording, just uh, email at invest at originclear.com. We'll get you a link. So, um, and I see a QA. and uh, just stand by for a second. So that centralized network is one that is, um, all goes into these lift stations of sewage lines bring things to a central location. So it's a transportation network primarily. All right. And um, by contrast, you have um, decentralized infrastructure. What does that mean? This future, by future, he's in 2016. Uh, things are changing. And here we have um, three factors which are enabled. First of all, the problem with the central wastewater treatment plant at the bottom right is that it, it's, it's got a pipes problem because infrastructure either is not being maintained in a country like the U.S. or doesn't exist in a country like India. 
it can't take dirty water, but maybe it can it take small pipes uh, because there's lower volumes of water and there's recycling happening. Um, and so there's various, you know, industrial cooling reuse, so various things like that. Um, reduce hydraulic loading to downstream centralized facilities. Again, um, hydraulic loading means water, water volume to these centralized facilities. You can, you have fewer of them. And because you are where you are and able to implement these advanced technologies, remember that those multiple technologies allows you to use, reuse your water. I've often said when water in here in LA, when water is uh, treated down in a big Hyperion uh, plant down by the ocean, it's not going back upstream to my home. It's going into the ocean. And so the last opportunity to reuse water is right where I'm using it. That's really where it's at. Um, trying to get the central facility to then do, you know, toilet to tap and all that crazy stuff. First of all, citizens hate it, hate it. You know, they don't want toilet to tap. And secondly, toilet to tap literally means taking the poop water and turning it into drinking water. And that's not what's needed. You just reuse the water for industrial cooling or for sprinklers and so forth. So um, that makes sense. And so you can do that right where you're using the water. So fine, but here's the issue. Why hasn't this been implemented on a wide scale? Now, um, again, remember this is almost four years ago, but there's some key reasons which are still very important to remember. Number one, scaling down technologies. How do you take these big, big iron, big water and get them, you know, squunch down? And that's, that's a major issue. Um, number two, you got to do, you know, um, the, uh, the internet of things, right? Um, IOT. And so you need uh, IOT devices monitoring all these things. And that's beginning to happen. Those, those integrated things with uh, network uh, operating centers, NOx, managing these things, so all that automation, that's another piece of technology. System reliability relates to the technologies. And finally, regulations. Um, there is uh, a need for many places for liberalizing regulations. Now that is being relaxed in part because here's what happens. Let's say uh, a legislature in Sacramento passes a law that arsenic levels in the water have to be cut in half. Well, the local wastewater plant, you know, the municipality doesn't have the ability to do that. And so guess what? They tell the arsenic producers, you reduce it. Well, now they've just told the arsenic producer to handle it themselves. Well, now they got to allow them to have a decentralized system. And so it's being driven by the need for these municipalities to offload the um, obligations they can't handle. So that's another major factor. So these are all things that are multi-technology and also one that's legal, but relates to um, an infrastructure issue, which is wastewater treatment plants delegating their obligations. Okay, now modular systems are the answer. Um, this happens to be one of ours. It's a 10,000 gallon per day unit. It's been built in the factory trucked out, it's dropped in the ground, put to work. It's got all these chambers inside and it's because it's got this structural rigidity, it doesn't need a lot of um, walls, no, just have a pad, you know, a foundation, put it on the foundation, strap it down and you're set. Now the, the, um, so you're, you're deploying, this is the deployment technology. So this is a great way to get it out there. Right. Um, it's like the inventors of the laptop, which was compact. You know, what did, they didn't invent. They started with a huge briefcase that was um, existing technologies basically scrunched together. And what they invented was the box, the luggable computer. This is uh, Origin Clear's technology that we acquired through uh, our amazing Dan Early. And he uh, brought us this. The, the, there's five patents and so forth. And that is a delivery method. Within it are some breakthrough technologies I'm going to tell you about briefly. And finally, there is the ability to do remote monitoring. So we're part of that whole decentralized movement. Okay. Today's Dan Early story. Well, I'm going to tell this to you quickly because um, we're, at, we're at the half hour mark and I don't want to go much beyond that um, for fear of boring you. But the, tele the story he told um, a private utility owner 
in Alabama owns and operates an older wastewater lagoon system that serves a residential community. Okay, it's a trailer park. <laughs> That's a long way to say there's a trailer park with a lagoon. Now, here's what's amazing is that there are lagoons in um, that wastewater treatment plants have these lagoons and that they, um, this is how they take care of their dirty water. Um, and um, by the way, I, I do have a Q and A that I just wanted to address here. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll discuss, Mr. Oiche, thank you very much. I will, I will bring up your kind uh, Q&A shortly. But anyway, so it's amazing that trailer parks all over uh, America dispose of their poop in a lagoon and they just let it be. Problem is that the local EPA goes, you know, that's not okay. And these uh, trailer parks are stuck. Um, now, this form of treatment has been around for more than 75 years. Environmental uh, regulations, this and thousands of similar trailer parks are driving much more uh, in increasingly stringent permits. And they, they couldn't, uh, they wanted to sell the facility and they couldn't. So struggled for nearly four years until they came to us. And then they, um, we decided to use our advanced fixed film biological treatment system and uh, by deploying a highly porous fixed film media reactor system in an equipment package that floats in lagoon surface. Literally, you have this thing bobby on the surface of the lagoon. And um, it simply um, be deployed, if you throw it in the lagoon, you're done. The fixed film media system begins treatment by fostering a perfect environment for biofilms to grow and thrive. Now, biofilms basically are they, they 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 coat themselves on the, on this in this uh, film, um, and they then digest the the mess, the carbon and nitrogen, and turn them into non harmful byproducts. So literally, think of sort of the the these these um, these biofilms hanging in the water and having kind of a fuzz, <laughs> literally, and that turns these you know poop into good stuff. So. Now, this is simple and cost-effective to deliver. It converts the lagoon into a sustainable asset, very energy efficient. The water, the fixed film bioreactor is constantly treating the water because it is constantly um, seeding the organic sludge that, that's at the bottom. And after a while, because that, that what's the, 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 the the biofilm thriving on the floating reactor will shed excess beneficial bacteria that will set it, uh, settle to the bottom, and then they will digest the sludge at the bottom, and then you will no longer have to dredge that lagoon or do la lagoon closure. No heavy and expensive ex excavation was needed. Um, didn't have to worry about the erosion control plans, stormwater management plans. No need for expensive plumbing, electrical sub subcontractor, no need for sediment, etc. No worries about long construction schedule or weather delays. So what, this is an elegant solution for trailer parks. And we have it now, it's running. And the, uh, the owners of this trailer park are delighted. The problem is literally being solved in a matter of weeks. And um, they'll be able to get full money for their, their trailer park. And if you are interested in buying trailer parks that are in trouble and refurbishing them with this kind of technology, or if you're an existing trailer park owner, please contact us. Um, you know, you can come to originclear.com under products and there's uh, forms you can fill out or just send it to info at originclear.com. All right. And of course, you can always send it to invest at originclear.com. So that's Dan, uh, today's Dan Early's story and I appreciate it. I want to get Dan on, on split screen next week because I think it's going to be fun. He's just a fantastic guy. So um, now uh, let me read. Um, here we go. All right. Hello, Riggs. I would like to start off saying that I've been extremely impressed with your company. I've monitored Origin Clear's progress ever since I received the announcement of the collaboration with Enesis, which is our company in, Paris, in France, several years ago. In the UK, we have an ongoing nitrate issue in drinking and wastewater, stopping thousands of property developments. I believe your water systems can resolve this. 
We would like to speak to you or your colleagues about this. What's the best contact info? Kind regards, Orche. And um, <laughs> well, we just literally covered something that we, this, this, it's amazing because I hadn't even read your, Orche, your, your note uh, fully. And that's crazy of me that I should do that. But nonetheless, um, just fill out a form. Worst case, you can always send an email to in, um, invest at originclear.com. We'll be happy to answer it. Uh, now, um, Arthur Fitzgerald, how will the new offering affect the existing preferred shareholders? All right. Well, that takes me to my next slide. So um, I will answer you, Arthur, who's one of my good friends because he's been such a faithful shareholder. Uh, the Fitzgeralds are wonderful. So um, wrapping up the offering. So I've been talking for a couple of weeks now about wrapping up the current offering. I will spend more time on it next week. And here's the beauty of the current offering. It's what I would call a keystone offering, meaning that, first of all, you are not being sold shares, all right? The shares that you receive are entirely uh, a grant. They're what's called a kicker, they're free. So instead what you are doing is you're lending money to Origin Clear. It's being repaid and you earn interest, 8% along the way, is secured by our revenue bearing company. And what's important, so, the, so that, uh, to answer your question, Arthur, that isn't affected at all because that is a repayment schedule. And your stock that you receive is actually also price protected. So you are, um, you have a protection. I went ahead and talked about it anyway. But nonetheless, that's in a nutshell. I'll get more serious about it next uh, week. But Arthur, just to let you know that your investment in the current offering is, shall we say, uh, frozen in time, right? You're not, um, the way it's designed is that there is an adjustment for price. Um, now, we believe this, the stock price is going to go up for a variety of reasons. That's not because we think about the stock, um, we're not supposed to, but the fundamentals of the company are improving and I will be able to tell you more about that next week. So please tune in. Um, it's really about the fact that you are protected from the worst. And this new offering is a very interesting one, um, which I would like to get prepared further, but let's just say that it helps us get some key acquisitions done. And that's, uh, I believe the future of the company in 2020 is acquisitions. All right. So with that, I come to my last thoughts. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting to have this form to talk in because, um, you know, I, I don't often get a chance to just sit down and discuss these various trend things and so forth. Um, what, what I am seeing is um, a company that is really coming together. Why? First of all, because Tom Marchesello joined us um, a bit over a year ago, and he has just welded together an excellent team. They were excellent before, but they were not fully integrated. And, and today I'm seeing, I was like, <laughs> we're doing a, a review of our cash flow, and I was like, well, all right, this is okay. I mean, I like the, the, the news that I got uh, this week from our controller. Uh, uh, Eric and uh, and Tom was like, okay, things are really looking very nicely. Mark Stevens in Texas is an amazing uh, cash manager, but it's all coming together nicely. Um, that's the operations side. And then um, we hired this agency to bring more people to, the, to see the company, which is why you're probably in here because of them or some stuff that was related, related to what they did. And uh, we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, so we're able to get funding done because more and more people are looking at the company. We're able to operate better. And the final piece, I believe, the third leg of the stool, shall we say, is going to be um, what we do to acquire companies. And we have a solution does not require us to raise many millions of dollars, which has been the problem till now, has been raising millions of dollars. And how do you do that? Well, how about not raising millions of dollars? And we have, a, we have a format, we have a formula, and we'll be able to talk to you about it. So here are uh, some very important people. Ken Berenger is uh, one of the smartest people I know. He, he's definitely smarter than me. 
he is, but I was smart because I hired him. <laughs> Bill, Bill Gates said, you know, in one of his famous saying, always hire people who are smarter than you. And definitely that happened in the case of Ken Berenger, who's designed these amazing uh, packages. And Michael Mann is very much in the same league. He is uh, our VP of sales. He's been getting sales going of our modular systems. And he's also involved with our M&A, mergers and acquisitions. And he's been coming with, with amazing ideas. Those two just cook up amazing things. Devin Angus has been with us forever. He's, I think, the second um, most ancient employee in the company. And um, he's very able and he reflects my thoughts very well. He's able to pass them on to me very well. So please don't hesitate to contact him. Here's the numbers. And you can also send an email. Next week's webinar is going to be fun. I'll be discussing a lot more about uh, the business, uh, the offering that is sending soon. Uh, if you want to know more about it, please contact extension uh, 201 or 206 116. And um, I'm just checking to see there's, uh, there's no, ah, there's chat requests. Let's take a look. All right. Ken Bogert wants me to talk about origin clear sales, revenues, and new developments. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I probably should have looked earlier again. Let me take, take that next week. And um, Keith Roten has uh, an interesting question. We know that decentralization is the future, but how do we inform everyone? This is very true, Keith. I have been, just like Elon Musk was in the wilderness, I have been, in 2016, I was in the wilderness about decentralization. I was doing articles in the water trades and, and people were saying, well, there's no technology and this and that. And, um, the truth is, is that uh, we are going to inform people, you know, the uh, AGM agency, the, the people that we hired, they, they're responsible for Dr. Berg, who you may have heard of with Keto, and they've made Dr. Per, Dr. Berg a household name um, and many other uh, examples like that. So we think we can be a big piece of it. And these, like this trailer park example, is a great story that we're going to be telling. I have a, a, a magazine that contacted me wanting case studies. So we're going to get it out, uh, tell the story to the public. You know, how can a trailer park become not so nasty for the people living there, for the people, for the groundwater, et cetera, and getting those specific stories out, I think is the key. I will do more on this. We need to continue to spread the word. Um, please spread the word about this uh, live Zoom briefing. And I really look forward to, to seeing you. So Ken Bogert, I will talk more about Origin Clear. Sales and revenues, remember that I will be able to talk very soon about Q4 and what happened in 2019, but I must have final numbers. I'm not allowed to say. Um, and uh, I think I've spoken about uh, new developments, but there will be more. So tune in next week. And we'll also figure out together how to get decentralization known about because it is happening already. So with that, I wanted to thank you um, for, uh, for being here and for, you know, listening to me. I would like to invite you to come back and um, let's now call it a day. Good night and enjoy your weekend.